Can I first of all welcome everyone to what is our third Stockport Recovery Board uh, webinar, which we hope will help you all to navigate uh, through the uncertainties that we all find ourselves in at the moment. The government has created a diverse package of financial assistance to help businesses survive the current crisis, save jobs and protect as much as we can the economy. But what we don't know is what will, it look, what will the long term impact be and how long will it take actually to recover and what might recovery look like? This afternoon, we are delighted to welcome um, Dr. John Ashcroft, one of the UK's leading voices in economic strategy and financial markets. His flagship product is the Saturday Economist, who many of you may well be familiar with, which is John's weekly update on the UK and world economy. John first attended one of our business events back in March 2016. I don't know if anybody can guess what that was about. But it was ahead of the Brexit referendum when no one was really informed enough to know which way to go. Sorry about this, John, but there seems to be a bit of a pattern occurring here. And uh, here we go again. Nobody really knows what's going to what's, what's be like. So I'm going to say no more and just hand over to you. OK, Thank well, you. thanks, Helen, and thanks for that um, introduction. Yeah, it's quite some time since we did the Brexit event. That was the first one in the series I was going to do. And I think it led on to about 15, 20 or 25 presentations talking about Brexit. So um, yeah, it was quite an interesting event. But I think um, it's interesting now because we've had the, obviously the COVID experience and real <clears throat> questions about what's gonna happen in the UK economy. So first of all, let me say thanks to you for inviting me today and thanks to everybody who's attending the session. If you've been to one of my sessions before, you'll know there's like, um, an intense amount of content, so it will move through at pace, but um, hopefully we'll get through it. And as I say, it should be quite interesting. Okay, so today we'll be talking about the duration of the pandemic, uh, the damage to the economy that we're seeing at the moment, and the shape of the recovery. Uh, there'll be time for what we call our market wrap, or we look at the market update. And our special feature on the White House Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Yeah, because we like to track what's going on in the White House. So we always watch um, Jimmy Kimmel, who's a great uh, friend of Trump, as you'll see. But, but is... our fake president wants prompted to give one, did have a real message of compassion for those who've lost someone to the virus. And to the people that have lost someone, there is nobody, I don't sleep at nights thinking about it, there is nobody that's taken it harder than me. <laughs> yeah, nobody taking, even in grief, he is number one. No yeah, he is number one, even in grief. So first we're going to look at the duration of the pandemic. And as you know, it started in Wuhan, there were 60,000 cases, there was a 4.6% fatality rate. And now it's led on to something like 7.5 million cases around the world with 420,000 deaths and a 5.6% fatality rate. And the caseload is still rising <clears throat> in America and it's also rising in, uh, in, uh, in South America, especially in Brazil at the moment. So the outbreak began in China and there were 84,000 cases recorded, again a 5.5% fatality rate. In terms of uh, Korea, Similarly, there were 12,000 cases and 273 deaths, a 2.3% much lower fatality rate. And when we look at the history of pandemics, what we see is that actually, the, the generally the pandemics fall one cycle. There isn't much evidence of um, a second wave. We always talk about what happened in uh, 1918, but we have to remember the second wave coincided with um, Armistice Day. So hundreds and thousands of troops and hundreds and thousands of refugees were going going home, traveling home, troops to America, troops back to come up, troops back to India and to Australia. So no wonder that there was good surge in, in, a, in the second wave in a time when there was very low hygiene, there was little sanitation, there were problems with, um, with, with food and nutrition and starvation and so on. So generally we see one wave of the epidemic. We see we do a normal distribution curve, 90 day episode is what we learn when we use, we track viral modeling for uh, stuff we do with uh, social media and also with the uh, financial markets. But generally, we see, as with foot and mouth, there was a, like a 90-day episode, and the majority of the cases occur in a 40-day quarantina. It's a quarantina period because the Venetians, in ancient Venice, used this period of 40 days to isolate 
foreign ships coming into the ports. 95, 80 to 95% of the cases occur in this tight period. And it's all based on what we call this SIR model, susceptible, the infected and recovered. I just want to show you a short clip from uh, Professor Trevor Bazit in Cincinnati. It's a 50 minute clip overall, actually a little episode of that. If you watch the full clip, then have a pen and paper handy and also a bag of frozen peas to keep to your head. In this video, we're going to investigate the mathematics of an epidemic that's spreading around the world. How can researchers around the world come up with mathematical models that predict things such as what is the rate of the spread of the epidemic, how bad is the epidemic going to be, and so forth. In this video, we're going to study a simple epidemic model called the SIR model. Let me show you some graphs of what the S of T, the I of T, and the R of T may possibly look like. Yeah. I'm going to cut it there because he does, he does go on. It's very interesting, very fascinating, but you want to understand what is happening in terms of viral modeling. And it is a mathematical phenomenon. It's not a virology issue. It's a mathematical phenomenon as they put it together. But it's all about the R0. You know, we've heard a lot about the R0, the rate of transmission of infections, which varies according to different diseases that we have seen. So HIV was about two to five, it was said. Polio, five to seven. Mumps, 10 to 12. <clears throat> and we think that um, COVID, is around 2.5, or was at the onset. And within that, there's an excellent book by Adam Kucharski from the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who talks about the R0 being a function of the dots, the duration of the disease itself, once it's been contracted, the opportunities to transmit, which can be mitigated by quarantine, isolation, and social distancing, the transmission probability, which can be minimized by PPE, and susceptibility, inevitable search at some stage for a final vaccine. But what we had is this concept of herd immunity. And we know that with the herd immunity, if, you, if the, if the um, R0 is 4, for example, the level of natural immunity, which has to be generated, is around 75%. If it's 2.5, it has to be around 60%. But when this number of 80% herd immunity cropped up, then what happened was Professor Neil Ferguson came up with his forecast, if you like, that there could be with 80% infection rates and a 1% uh, fatality rate, there'd be half a million deaths in the UK and 2.2 million in America, which is what we call a tug the moment, tug, tug the rug moment in, in, um, in consultancy work or just grab the attention of the client and so did that. But Ferguson predicted 200 million would die of bird flu, there were 282. He estimated that 65,000 would die from swine flu, there were 457. So his track record isn't all that great. And what we do know is this level of uh, infection across the UK could be much lower as the epidemic sweeps through. The Spanish flu had an infection rate of 20%. The infection rate on the Diamond Princess was 20%. A survey, a sample survey of 3,000 in the US, suggests the infection rate was 20%. And there's the excellent work at Guy's Hospital where it talks about this. They have a great uh, COVID tracker and they reckon there were 2.2 million at the peak at the beginning of April. And when we do our back, we can do back casting on that, comparing data with Guy's and Imperial and, and others. And we find that there could have been 50 million reports and 60 million episodes and 12 million cases, i.e. had nearly a 20% infection rate in the UK as we pass through it. So the proposition is, you know, there's a tight focus to the epidemic. There is a, a suggestion that 20% could well have been the peak and we would have seen it. Uh, but as Adam Kucharski says, once you've seen one pandemic, now you've seen one pandemic. And we know that the infection rates vary dramatically and also the fatality rates have varied quite dramatically. And when you put them together, then how can you as a government decide what your level of infection might be and how can you decide what the level of fatality is going to be? So herd immunity went out and in came isolation, containment and lockdown. And we saw that the episode in Europe has come and gone. And as we look at the UK, we now think the episode has come and gone. This looks like a decapitated um, perfect distribution, if you like, because we haven't captured all the, the people within that framework. And when we look at the number of UK deaths and the number of UK cases, then clearly we have passed the peak and uh, hopefully we need to get it finally under control. So isolation, containment and lockdown are now out and it's test, track and trace. 
which is going to be like looking for a needle in a haystack. We just can't find the victims to analyze them or to develop the vaccine at the moment. So test, track and trace is in. So with a face mask, get out there if you can, because it looks as if we've passed the peak, the wave may be closing, the social costs have been high, the health costs have been high, but the economic costs have been astronomical. And I said right at the start, if we apply these medieval measures of containment and isolation and quarantine to a contemporary economy, then we'll all get back, driven back to the dry, dark ages. And that's why the Treasury now, the argument between the scientists and the economists or the scientists and SAGE and the Treasury is becoming more acute towards the side of the economists and the Treasury because the costs are just so astronomical. How do we get out of it? Let's talk of region, age and sector or nurseries, junior schools and secondary schools or garden centres and car dealerships, which we've now seen. I'm trying to get businesses and construction and SMEs back to work. So Javid had this idea of let the young get on with their lives. You know, if you're over 70, in my case, I'm over 70, you won't see the light of day for a couple of years yet. But he wanted to give more freedom to younger people so they can get on with their lives and at the same time help the rest of us by rebuilding our economy, which benefits everyone. Excellent. Fortunately, we're not going down that route. So we know that ministers, they have a plan to get us back into business and they're searching for all of the ways they could do that. Yeah, they're searching. See what I did there, that little plug-in. But anyway, so we know that being cure opening, the garden centre opening, I know because I went to Bent's, didn't do much, but I had a pork pie yesterday as well. But back in Bent's, McDonald's are opening soon. Hairdressers are opening in July, much to relief of many. Restaurants are set to follow. Pubs could be open sooner than we expect. The shopper numbers are set to jump. With people queuing like from 5.30 in the morning to go to Ikea with zigzag queues in the car park almost a mile long. I mean, there is such a pent up demand. Now we know the zoos are gonna open and schools, they're gonna open uh, in weeks. Oh no, no, they're not gonna open in weeks because the plan to open all schools have been dropped. The argument between the scientists and the economists is now getting swayed by the political complications of the, of the issues involved. Social distancing could be, din social distancing could be ditched Mm. Oh, no, it won't, came back the argument. Oh, yes, it will, says uh, uh, Rishi Sunak, because the Treasury just needs to get everybody back in place. And you cannot run a pub, you cannot run a restaurant with uh, limited occupancy, uh, with, with social distancing at two metres. So social distancing is going gonna, is gonna to be ditched, and we'll go back to that one metre rule, as the WHO, the World Health Organisation, suggests. And when we listen to Yvonne Doyle from uh, Public Health England, the organisation is amassing evidence to evaluate if, 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 if the two metre rule is absolutely necessary. The two metre rule is a precautionary approach, which is killing the leisure and tourism sector, but it's a precautionary approach and it could change to allow closer contact. It has to change to allow closer contact. And I think that, you know, at the moment, the government's expense quite a bit of political capital with Dominic Cummings, that didn't help. But um, there's a bit of tweeting and throwing in cabinet and a lot of pressure from the scientists who are breaking rank on position at the moment. But you cannot get back to any sort of normality in the leisure sector if you do not cut back on the social distancing rule. The quarantine rules are a mystery to many also and a bit of a stunt according to, um, to, to many in, certainly those in the, um, in, in the travel industry. Why on earth we're re imposing a 14 day quarantine now at this stage in the cycle is quite amusing. And now it's all about bubbles apparently. It's about, you know, having your own family bubble. Who's allowed in a family bubble? Kids are allowed to see their grandparents as long as there's only one of them. And uh, if it's one parent family with two children, they can see, yeah, it's all very, interesting and challenging, but it's all about bubbles, all about bubbles at the moment. Now, many were not gonna make it back, and we know there's gonna be a rationalization uh, of uh, retail bases and of um, a restaurant bases. But in the US, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, Trump, he's got it covered. You said many times that the US is doing far better than any other country when it comes to testing. Yes. 
why does that matter? Why is this a global competition to you if every day Americans are still losing their lives and we're still seeing more cases every day? Well, they're losing their lives everywhere in the world. And maybe that's a question you should ask China. Don't ask me, ask China that question, okay? When you ask them that question, you may get a very unusual answer. Yes, behind you, please. What, sir, why are you saying that to me specifically? I'm telling you, I'm not saying it specifically to anybody. I'm saying it to anybody that would ask a nasty question That's like that. That's not a nasty Please question. go ahead. Why does it matter? Okay, uh, anybody else? Please go ahead in the back, please. I have, I have two questions. No, it's okay. But we'll you go, pointed yeah. to me. I have two questions, Mr. Next, President. Next, next, please. But you did. You called on me. I did, and you didn't respond. And now I'm calling on. Sorry, I just the young lady in the back, please. I just want to let my colleagues okay. finish. But can I ask you Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Appreciate but it. Thank you very much. Mm, yeah, yeah, there goes off in the silk man. But generally, at the moment, there are nearly two million cases in the uh, in the USA. Over twenty thousand every day at the moment. Over a hundred thousand, hundred ten thousand deaths. Um, so the rate at which they're opening up, because we're opening up Las Vegas and in other places, they're opening up the billiard halls and the, the bingo parlors in Georgia or whatever. So again, <clears throat> Trump has a genuine concern, but he's distracting. He has to deflect from the challenges he has in the US, talking about China, and also this creation of an Obamagate uh, fascination. And in one of your Mother's Day tweets, you appear to accuse President Obama of the biggest political crime in American history by uh, far. Those were your words. What crime exactly are you accusing President Obama of committing? And do you believe the Justice Department should prosecute him? Uh, Obamagate. It's been going on for a long time. It's been going on from before I even got elected. And it's a disgrace that it happened. And if you look at what's gone on, and if you look at now all of this information that's being released, and from what I understand, that's only the beginning. Uh, some terrible things happened, and it should never be allowed to happen in our country again. And you'll be seeing what's going on over the next, over the coming weeks. But I, and I wish you'd write honestly about it. But unfortunately, you choose not to do so. Yeah, John, please. Crime. What is the crime exactly that you're uh, accusing him of? You know what the crime is. The crime is very obvious to everybody. All you have to do is read the newspapers, except yours. Yeah. There you go. So the, the, there is a serious crisis in the U.S. Um, Trump is now 14 points behind in the polls against Biden. He's looking for deflection with uh, China looking for a deflection with Obamagate, tried to create the crisis on the riots in the streets in, in Washington last week, which was quite concerning. So I think that, yeah, in terms of the duration of the pandemic, there's still a bit of a way to go in the US, but one would hope that in the UK and certainly in Europe, the wave has passed and we don't attach much probability to maybe some minor outbreaks, but we don't attach high probability to the risk of a second wave. And now we're going to talk about the damage to the economy and the shape of the recovery. Uh, so the World Economic Outlook, if we look at what is said by Kristalina Georgieva from the uh, IMF, it's like the roaring 20s, the global economy risks the return of the Great Depression is her great fear. <clears throat> the IMF forecasts for the world were about 3.3% growth this year, and actually now it's a 6.6% uh, drop, which is similar to the figures coming out of the OECD. So the three slides we're gonna look at in quick succession, don't focus on the detail, there's too much to take in, but generally everyone everywhere is getting hit. We expect that the downturn in the world will be around 6.6% this year. In China, growth was 6.1% in 2019. Now it's had a 6.8% drop in Q1. And even so, with the banks back in China experience at the moment, they could still see growth of uh, over 1% in the current year even though the central government has stopped making forecasts about what would happen. In the US, we are up to Jay Powell to talk about his forecast of what's happening in America. While many standard economic statistics have yet to catch up with the reality we're experiencing, it's clear that the effects of the econ on the economy are severe. Millions of workers are losing their jobs. Next week's jobs report is expected to show that the unemployment rate, which was at 50-year lows just two months ago, has surged into double digits. Household spending has plummeted as people stay home, and measures of consumer, consumer sentiment have fallen precipitously. Hotels, airlines, restaurants, department stores, and other retailers have been particularly hard hit. 
manufacturing output fell sharply in March and is likely. Yeah, Paul goes on. Actually, it's the same. It's a mirror image of what has happened in the UK, not to the extent of the unemployment. We saw the 40 million people unemployed in the USA. <clears throat> we have seen very high levels in the UK as well. But uh, the furlough scheme came to the re rescue of many. But on the latest Fed forecasts, which were released yesterday, the Fed expects a drop in output of 6.5% in the UK this year, in the USA this year, and a 5% growth in the following year. And again, we'll see a similar pattern, maybe slightly deeper for us, uh, when we look at the data later on. And the unemployment rate, having been a marvelous 3.7%, is gonna jump up to just around 10% by the end of the current year, mitigating through 2021 and 2022. Again, a similar pattern as we will see for the UK. 40 million unemployed in March, 2.5 million jobs were added in April. There will be a big swing back in, in uh, the US because of the 40 million jobs lost, 8 million were in the uh, hotel and leisure sector. And if Disney start opening as they're going to open in Florida and elsewhere, the number of bounce back jobs will be swift. Roughly the 2.5 million, half of them were in the leisure sector. But the 2.5 million was good news. And Trump couldn't wait to lash into it in terms of grabbing into it in terms of his good news forecast. And he will look at, this is the Seth Meyers. He's one of the guys I like to track. Today is probably, if you think of it, the greatest comeback in American history. But you, it's not going to stop here. It's going to keep going. Our stock market is almost, it's just short of an all-time high. I've had 144 all-time high stock markets during a three-and-a-half-year period. Nobody's ever come close to that. And we're going to do it again. But it's going to be even stronger than last time. When I would say that to you two, three months ago, I could see what's happened. I have a good feel. I've always done well with numbers. Yeah, he's always going to done well with numbers. <clears throat> Not the poll numbers at the moment, where the, uh, the campaign team are challenging the uh, research, which is suggesting that Biden's ahead in the poll. But even as the, you know, the, the economy in the US faces these 100,000 deaths, 110,000 deaths, Trump's bragging about the stock market and what's going to happen. As you know, the NASDAQ did hit a new high. So. What's going to happen in the UK? Well, there are four challenges to deal with. There's the aftermath of COVID, social distancing, travel restrictions, leisure and entertainment sectors badly hit. There's the recession impacts in the UK with unemployment hit, spending hit, investment to be hit, and challenges to the housing market. There's the ongoing challenge from digital disruption, trends which we had seen before the COVID experience, which have been accelerated and will continue to accelerate because of the COVID experience. So in terms of retail trends, online sales, AI, and conferencing, these things are gonna have, continue to have an impact. And then there's the remaining problem we've talked about for a long time, Boris and Brexit. So we're analyzing the issues into the COVID challenges, challenges from recession, any recession, the ongoing thrill of digital disruption, as it rips through the uh, standardization of, of uh, what we experienced before, and Boris and Brexit, and Trump and tariffs. And we know consumers are nervous about going back to the cinema, about going to pubs and clubs, about going to concerts and sporting events and gyms and so on. In varying degrees, they have concerns. But one may be quite positive about this, because if you think about the bombing experience, the recent terrorist bombing experience in Manchester, there was a situation where people who were avoiding pubs and restaurants and the city centre for a short time, but gradually and not very long, they return. And we, one would expect that, one will expect that the, the consumers will start to behave as they did previously. They'll have short memories about what life as it was during lockdown. But there are many questions remaining. Trade policy, immigration policy, spending plans, the budget, infrastructure, HS2, but we're all in this together. And Boris Johnson explained that, yeah, we're all in this together to varying degrees. Choate, Robert Choate is the chairman of the OBR, and this is what he was saying about the prospects for the UK. Hello. In addition to its consequences for public health and families' well-being, the spread of the coronavirus is likely to have severe short-term consequences for the UK's public finances, thanks primarily to the economic disruption arising from the necessary public health restrictions currently being imposed upon us. The government's policy response will also have a large direct budgetary cost, but the measures are designed to limit the long-term economic and fiscal damage. We can be confident that the cost of inaction will be much greater. 
Yeah, it has gone actually, but I think that it looks like some pub somewhere in Richmond in the back garden. But generally, they're, they're talking about government GDP being down 35% in this current quarter, April to June. The borrowing is going to go up to by 220 billion, 300 billion even by this current year. Job losses set to soar. GDP down by 12.8% in the year, and the unemployment rate at 7.3% by the end of the year. And there are several forecasts from uh, economists <clears throat> around the, uh, which we analyze as a treasury analyzes about 40 forecasters, that the median forecast is at a drop of 12.7% in this current quarter. That's going to be too low. What we've done is taken, the, and here we get into some heavy numbers. I apologize, we're into some heavy numbers with detailed slides, but it's quite important that we looked at the pattern of the furlough scheme. So accommodation and food service at 80% shut down and applied those numbers to um, the sectors within the economy. And what we can see is certain sectors like hotels and restaurants were particularly badly hit uh, and real estate down by 30%, manufacturing down by 30%. And by applying these weighted averages for each of the sectors, we come up with this figure of a 20% drop in terms of GDP growth in the current quarter. And again, when we look at the pattern of recovery we expect, so hotels and restaurants reopening towards the end of the year, other sectors like manufacturing, the reduction in terms of loss of output mitigating quite quickly, that we see or we think that the output could be done by 20% this quarter and over 12% in, in the third quarter, Q3, and Q4, they would be done by about 6%. And what that would mean for the year is that there would be a drop of, well, first of all, a, a drop of 10% in the year as a whole in the UK. And you get this V-shaped recovery because once you get into the end, of the year and get into the next year, the Q2 comparison is so positive because you have such a poor base to which to compare it. So we generally see, is it a strong recovery? It's a V-shaped or a Nike tick-shaped recovery that we expect. There are always Vs. You know, the question about what shape will it be? There are always Vs. Since the Second World War, any time of any real data, it's always been a V. It's always been a V sign. But we know 7 million jobs are at risk. And there's Andy Holbein, chief economist of the Bank of England. He's trapped in the larder, I think, at his own home. But here he comes. Oh, I lost him. I don't know if getting back. Yeah, here he comes. For a great many people across uh, the UK, we probably have I mean, only between a, a quarter and a third uh, of the workforce uh, inactive right now, you know, either unemployed or underemployed because they've been furloughed from their job. And for those people, you know, between a quarter and a third, uh, their incomes will take a big hit and they will be definitely feeling uh, financially stretched. All of our evidence at the Bank of England suggests the degree of stretch for a great many people is very considerable uh, right now. And there he is. <clears throat> and when we look at the unemployment figures, then what we saw was in the Q1, we we're in a pretty good position with 1.4 million unemployed. That would have shot up to about 8.3 million without the furlough scheme. I'll look at that in a bit more detail. But generally, one would see the unemployment situation easing towards the end of the year. But nevertheless, our own forecasts would, would suggest that are going to be near 9% unemployment by Q4. We also know that 8.4 million have been furloughed. And the total claim is like 14 billion per month. And 8.4 million furloughed with 1.5 million unemployed, 2 million, on, 2 million on universal credit. No wonder that Rishi Sunak is the biggest employer in the UK, or the biggest paymaster in the UK at the moment, um, with borrowing to hit 62 billion. In April, sorry, the borrowing was 62 billion, the revenue was done by 26%, expenditure fell by 50%, the VAT take fell by, fell by 44%, and overall, the tax take fell by 36%. This is why the Treasury is panicking at the moment, because you cannot carry on with this level of loss. Paul Johnson at the IFS says it's a mega recession, a recession to end all recessions, and Rishi Sunak says it's a severe recession with more hardship to come. 
Well, the critical thing at this time is to provide that support through what will be a temporary disruption to our economy. But this is very severe. I've made that point before. Lots of jobs are at risk. Lots of businesses are suffering, which is why we've put in place all the measures we have. It's to provide that bridge, that lifeline to get through a temporary period. And then we can get back to bounce back to normal as quickly as possible thereafter. Yeah, the bounce back will come. These are the figures from the PMI market series where we look at construction, manufacturing and the um, service sector. So there's a tremendous drop in, the, in the April with a significant recovery in May. And as the, um, people return to work, as businesses return to some degree of normality, the bounce back in activities will be severe. But consumer confidence has taken a hit in terms of overall index from, in April from the GFK consumer confidence indices. People are worried about their personal situation, about the general economic situation, and really they don't think it's a great time to buy just at the moment. And retail sales we saw dropped by 23% in April, and significant that sales of alcohol were up by 63% in the month. <laughs> what can that mean? Whereas non-food and floor coverings, always a great one, watches and so on, anything that was not um, uh, food and drink related uh, was taking a hammering. I did ask predicted a 40% drop in sales in Q2. But what we did see, and this is interesting because this is one of those seismic shifts that one's now going to experience, that uh, online sales in April were 30% of all activity. And the big breakthrough here is uh, that online food sales <coughs> doubled in terms of their market share. So the 30% market share will bounce back as more stores reopen to about a 25% share overall. We thought we were going to take another year to get there. We've got there in one leap. So this online penetration is also is quite significant. <coughs> oh, there's Alibaba, there's not that bad. Yeah. Yeah, I put that in because I, I think it's important that we accept this online food sales. There's been a permanent shift online. And for most retailers, non-food retailers, the level of uh, online penetration is going to be like one in three. So one in three transactions lost to the internet. That means there has to be now a significant rethink of uh, footprint and footfall across all the stores. As they say, that they won't all reopen uh, in full. Some of the marginal stores that were kept there for a sort of marketing uh, footprint point of view will not be returned to because the structural shift, this COVID experience has accelerated uh, the move online. There have been winners like Boohoo and the Hut Group and entity figures today, and there have been losers like Primark who had no online presence whatsoever. In the car market, we saw car sales drop. They fell by 97% in April. The good news is they. There was a five-fold increase in sales in May, only down by 89%, but then the four courts were lost. Um, car sales dropping by 75% this current quarter, and maybe by 35% for the whole of the year. A billion pound bailout for JLR, lots of grief in the aerospace sector, um, with Boeing, British Airways, Airbus, Rolls Royce. The numbers are quite horrific in terms of that particular space, the tourism and leisure sector and the travel sector, really badly hit. Bleeding cash at an impressive rate at Airbus, 30,000 jobs at risk in the Emirates. And in the housing market, we saw transactions drop, new buyer inquiries dropping, and new instructions dropping. But for the moment, house prices, according to the latest data, year on year, they're still quite uh, positive. So we don't see any big shock to house prices in the recovery. The changing face of retail means that uh, the big challenges to people like Into and the, the retail parks, big challenges to commercial property. A uh, big increase in accelerating the growth of logistics in terms of warehousing and logistics and outdoor store presence. Amazon's robot warehouses, I won't show you that clip now, but um, pubs and restaurants have taken a hit, hotels and leisure. Travel and tourism moved to carry on camping. And in terms of government borrowing, the government borrowing is set to hit 300 billion this year. So Generally, that is going to create a great strain. We're going to see um, government debt about 2.3 million. But despite all that gloom and doom, the guys in the White House are really positive. 
I think next year is going to be a phenomenal economic year. I think that the following year has a chance to be one of our best years. So we have a transition third quarter. We're going to have a very good fourth quarter. We're going to have a great next year. I agree with the president. I think we're going to have one of the best years in the history of our economy. Yeah, my fancy agrees with it. Shop on everything. Now, Larry Kudlow, he's an interesting character. He's director of the NECD. Now, he's now become the Song and Dance Act when he's talking about the economy. America is coming back. Three million new jobs, lower unemployment rate, furloughed, temporary layoffs, going back to work, green shoots popping up everywhere, stocks are soaring, POTUS policies are working. Stay with the winners, Trump and Pence and me. The best is yet to come. Yeah, well, there you go. Who would have thought we're just four or five months away from the election? Okay, I'm not going to just wrap up and look at a couple of um, the market updates, as I promised. About four or five minutes to go in this form presentation, and we'll take some cues. But the bank uh, have uh, confirmed they're going to hold the bank rate at 0.1% with additional 200 billion of asset purchases, more QE. The current rate is 0.1%. We can't even see a rise next year to 25 basis points, even though I've pegged it in here at the moment. The best you could think of in terms of, well, should we look at it, 25 basis points next year and 50 basis points uh, by 2021. But the Fed made it clear yesterday they can't see any rate rise from the 0.25 holding. They won't see any rate rise until 2023, all through 2022. So that slide we saw for the UK, that's likely to be uh, out of, um, uh, going to be too pessimistic or optimistic, depending on what your view is on interest rates. We live in the life, in the world of what we call planet ZER, a world of zero interest rates policy. And <clears throat> when it started, when we got into this in December 2008, we were talking about that really, we didn't really know what we were doing. And I saw what I wrote then. This was Danny Valenchflower, who was uh, on the Monetary Policy Committee at that time, talking about what they were doing with QE. The reason, actually, is we didn't really have a plan on the way in. It was unique times. Voting for quantitative easing, as I did, it was, it, we, it was very scary. But we don't know the way out either. So they're really having to follow the data and watch what's happened and, put, and cross their fingers and hope. And we really are, really are there, crossing fingers and hoping economics. Yeah, and that was before the crisis. So 10-year guilt yields are down at the floor and the, the prospects for increasing are, uh, are pretty low as well. So <clears throat> for pension funds and insurance companies, the challenge of guilt yield is going to be significant for the next year or so. And we're in this world of what we call dire straits economics. With QE, I always call it money for nothing, guilt for free. It's very simple. The Treasury, or the government spends the money somewhere here. The Treasury have to find the money. They commission the debt management office to... Uh, sell the debt as gilts. The Bank of England now buy the gilts because they buy it under the QE program. The yields, because the bank debt gilts are underwritten. If anything goes wrong with that, that's underwritten by Treasury. And some bright spark at the Treasury realized that those dividends, those coupons being paid to the bank, they're actually ours. So now what happens is when the bank receives the dividends, then it has to send them back to Treasury. This money for nothing, gilts for free process continues with the bank ready to stand there as the buyer of last resort. Charts there. Ted, see what's happening with oil. Oil prices bouncing back from the low. Um, and just a quick look at what's happening in the currency markets at the moment. So we see um, dollar sterling with a rally. We've seen a rally. Now it's trading between 125 and 130. I was on a conference call talking about the prospects for uh, the dollar last week. Um, in terms of euro dollar, Again, evidence of upside potential of, with weakness in the dollar from the euro. Uh, NASDAQ, we've seen it a new high yesterday as the market's going nuts. A bit more reticence with the Dow and with the standard S&P. And for the FTSE, a lot of toil ahead if it's going to get near to where it was in terms of its own level. So there we are, my market wrap and do all the issues. Don't forget, you can join me on LinkedIn. If you're not on LinkedIn, we should sign up. Uh, follow me at JK on the line on Twitter. And also sign up for updates from the Sunday Economist. So thanks, Helen. That's a lot of content, but we have to get through it. Now I'll take cues. Any questions?
they're already still there. Thank you very much for that, John. I do have a couple of questions that have been put to me um, while you've been speaking. Okay. Um, I'll take the first from uh, Melissa Johnson from CDL, who actually put her question in previously. What do you estimate the impact of different Brexit outcome, outcomes will be on the economy as it seeks to recover from the coronavirus crisis? Um, um, and she cited a Brexit in which an FTA with the EU has been agreed takes place on the 1st of January 2021, or a no-deal Brexit takes place on the 1st of January 2021. Do you have any ideas for us? Uh, yeah, well, I think we uh, always argued that um, to divide, which would argue, in fact, this is what happened when we did the con four years ago, but you divide the arguments for Brexit into four pots. One is the political issue, next the social issue, and then the business issues and the economic issues. So generally, the political issue is about who governs Britain. Um, the second argument so it was always about immigration. That's Nobody's really stressing about immigration anymore. That was just a wind up at the time. But I always argued in terms of the business argument and the um, economic argument, there is no proposition whatsoever. It's going to be a bad move for uh, the UK from a business point of view and from uh, an economics point of view. And I think um, that the head of the CBI was, was reporting today that dealing with the exit from COVID, that's Caroline Furbin at the CBI, dealing with the exit from uh, COVID and also with the exit from Brexit, that's like... Um, setting your shed on fire while the host is still burning is what you were saying and really it's hard to imagine that you know going to a friend of mine at bsf this week and they were saying that when the government talks about the recovery from the from a business point of view from the epidemic there will be no recovery because they're going to be preparing for the shock of brexit so i think it's a great question but it's really something that's too heavy to get into today because it's just so at the moment, we can only think as far as getting out of getting through the COVID recovery process and the enormity of having to deal with a shock to the system and the likes of Brexit. You know, there's still many like me who still wake up every morning thinking it's always, it was just a bad dream. It's never going to happen. But uh, so, yeah, I can't really begin to think about it. Just, just so many challenges just to get through to the end of the year at the moment. Okay, I'd love to come back and deal with a second issue, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I have one here. Yes, I know, Steve. Yeah. Two questions from me. Quite surprised that the predicted acceleration from offline to online shopping isn't more defined. Your slide suggested one year's growth effectively in a few months. I've read more like five years and other predictions. People are reluctant to return to the high street, as we witnessed in, for example, China. Do you have any views on that? Well, I, I, I think, um, yeah. It could well be right, actually. I think what we, what we, what we have seen, the, the big thing we're waiting for is, it, so if you take it online, non-food online penetration is like 30% plus now. So there's always one in three transactions going online. And I think that what we've seen, what we, what we, this big shift, the big change through the, the uh, epidemic has been the growth in, um, in uh, online food sales. So that, that's a big transmission. That, that's something which will... You know, a lot of the retailers were expecting it, but didn't think it would happen quite so quickly. So I think the thing, the big jump has been, we've seen a big trend um, increase in online sales, which is continuing, and a big structural shift in, in food sales. So I think that generally, experience shopping is still good and important for many. And it could well be that, you know, the, I could be too, too conservative about the forecast. But I think to get to 25%, we're going to be at 25%, one in four transactions overall this year. That's over one in three non-food transactions. That's a hell of a penetration. And I think that um, it could well accelerate. It's interesting that you know, listening to um, online retailers complaining about returns, you know, people buying the product and returning them, it makes me smile, actually. Because I've been, once we've involved in the furniture industry, people would actually buy their new sofas just before Christmas to entertain the families. And then when Christmas was over, they shipped the whole lot back. <laughs> and so this online returns was interesting. And also listening to the chief executive of ASOS, he was saying that in China, the fashion sales, they actually deliver to the consumer, then wait at the door while people try it on before they bring it back if they don't like it. So I think, yeah, Steve could well be right. I don't think we're gonna see the penetration that you would see with, uh, uh, with um, I was going to say DVDs, who can remember those? But in terms of books and certain the download, downloads on, on, on music. But 
you know, it will be increasing. Uh, but yeah, it could be unconservative. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and tech for Steve, obviously. Um, and the second question from Steve was about house prices. Your slide flashed up that you didn't expect any great falls, I think. Is that no. really the case if we're about to experience the recession to end all recessions and unemployment bites? Isn't a house no. price crash likely? Well, I, I, th I think, again, you know, I have two biases to, 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 to which I confess. One is the contrarian bias. I always like to challenge conventional thinking. Uh, but equally, I have this, this um, optimism bias, so I have a more positive outlook. I think the thing is, with in terms of the recession to end all recessions, that is happening now in Q2. That really the depth of shutdown in Q2 is makes it the the real the low point of the cycle. And what we're going to see is a gradual recovery, with a more positive outlook month on month, quarter on quarter, with a recovery into next year. So. It's as if the worst, you know, when, when, when Paul Johnson at the IFS was talking about this, he really was talking about the experience in the current quarter. This drop of 30, 20 to 30% in Q2 is something we'd never seen before. So going back to the question about host prices, there's a lot of inertia built into host prices because people will just move away. The transactions will move away. So people will not put the host on the market. They will not be active in the buyer's market. So I think generally, I don't think the major houses have made a forecast at the moment, but it's the, um, it depends on the pattern of how unemployment rolls out because the furlough scheme is defending incomes and it's defending jobs and the treasury is saying look you've got to tell the people they've got to get back to work uh, because some people are enjoying furlough getting paid 80 percent you can't spend your money but some people don't want to go back to work and they're going to have to go back to work and this is the messaging we've moved from that terrorizing people to stay in their homes and really getting afraid to get out and shake hands with anybody don't even look at people in the eye as you walk through the streets. So we're moving from that mentality to say, yeah, it is safe to get out. It is safe to walk about and it is safe to go back to work. And especially SD is ditched for two reasons. So the outlook will continue to get better and better. So I think that'll protect host prices because the host price to incomes ratio is still quite good. And although we've seen in the deer in this current quarter, that really things will look better and better. And the news will just get better and better month on month and quarter on quarter. And people will see that's happening. And I think there's this natural inertia, natural ratchet effect to defend those prices at current levels. Okay, thank you very much for that. Do you, do you, do you also feel that um, one of the questions here we've had from Michelle Hayes, do, do you think that the recent Black Lives Matter protests will have a, um, an impact on the potential, way, potential prospect of a, of a second wave of the coronavirus in the UK? Well, I mean, that's, that's going to be more of a... Um, a scientific epidemiologist question to answer that really but I think uh, my central proposition would be the wave has been and gone almost been and gone and that there may be hope breaks the, the government have got themselves a hell of a heck of a fix with this r not thing you know coming in the r not's less than one clear the water the r not's lovely and in the U US in the northwest apparently we have an r not of 1.01 .01. but you know who would have thought you get regional are not on a daily basis to two decimal places. It's quite nonsense. It's just what we call spurious accuracy, suggesting there's a higher level of accuracy than is actually the case. So, the, and a lot of the cases at the moment are confined to the hospitals and the homes. So I think, you know, we've seen the wave come and gone. A lot of people, a lot more people will have been infected than is thought to have been the case. And the prospects of a big wave generated by anything um, is, is going to be very limited. So I'm not sure that the, the Black Lives Matter movement will be a significant trigger to a second wave or a, a significant outbreak. Yeah, how, how, how um, quickly or, or not, rather not, do you feel that the, actual, that, that the global markets will rally? Well, again, they'll each rally in turn. So I think, you know, there's the, the experiences, the evidence is in China at the moment that the recovery is, is, is going to be quite strong in China and something in Singapore. So in the, in the Far East, then they're going to see a significant recovery there. Uh, Europe, uh, we've seen a lot of damage. And in terms of the economy, they will we'll see domestic recovery there. Domestic demand will increase. The Germans slightly less so because they're vulnerable to world markets and uh, significant dependence on the USA. USA is a big issue because... You know, on the one hand, Kudlow can talk about a big bounce back, which would normally occur, and the bounce back will happen quickly. 
But generally, there is a real risk that uh, the US has opened up too soon. And if Trump starts his political rallies, that would be a bigger threat than the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think that generally, we'll see different parts of the world recovering in turn as they were hit by the epidemic. So China and the Southeast Asia recovering, Europe recovering. Secondly, then the, hopefully the US getting back on track would be a big trigger to growth. And we see that in Canada and also in New Zealand, Australia. So it'll be a sort of stage recovery. We used to talk about the locomotive theory when all the markets move together. No, they won't all be moving together. They'll all be moving in stages as they were hit by the epidemic or the pandemic, then as they recover out of the pandemic. So generally the outlook will be you know, good and positive as we move to the end of the year and into next year. And how much pressure do you think that there is on the government at the moment and, and, and how soon will they react to actually going along with the World Health Organization guidelines in reducing the social distancing? Well, I think, do, I think Johnson would do it tomorrow. I think the majority in cabinet want to do it. And I think that um, the, the, you can't, the, the pub and leisure sector, they're desperate to do it. And there's, there's no point um, them investing a lot of money in two meter social distancing standardization now because the rules have got to be relaxed. So I, I, it, it would have gone earlier, but they've had a few setbacks along the way with um, some political capital exhausted. And they lost the battle on schools. So that became a particular issue on schools. So schools was a setback for government. And it's a, it becomes a political issue. It's not a, you know, it's not a scientific issue versus economics. It's this political issue. And they lost that exhausted political, political capital on schools. And with Cummings a bit more as well. But SD, SD's got to go um, by July. I thought by the end of July, by the end of June, but into July for sure. It doesn't okay. work. No. And, and do you think, um, hindsight's a great thing, we all know that, don't we? Um, as we discussed many times after the Brexit debate. But do you think there was a time in the last three months when, when you feel that a different approach should have been made? I think, there, I think there's an argument for um, quarantining the scientists earlier. <laughs> <laughs> the, the scientists should have been put in lockdown and quarantined much earlier. And certainly they should not be allowed now. If you're taking your money, if you're taking government shilling as a sage advisor, you should keep stum about any mistakes that have been made. There have been mistakes, there will have been mistakes, but if a young cabinet faced with half a million deaths in the UK, you've got to be terrified about it. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody's seen anything like it before. So I think that if you take your scientific advisor, you should definitely keep stum. Otherwise you should be locked up and quarantined and not allowed out in public. I love that. Um, and do you think that there are any sectors that you've been surprised about in terms of the impact the, the uh, COVID-19 has had on them? Um, well, no, because I, I, once, you know, once, once we saw it happening, then it was easy to, to easy, terrible thing to say, but it was easy to transfer the data into a simple model. So the OBR model is pretty simple. You know, it's like the models I showed you. It's like if you break down the sectors and look at which ones are going to be affected, then yeah, I think, so once we had the data, it wasn't surprising. Before then, no, nobody knew what was going to happen. The government didn't know what was going to happen. The Treasury certainly didn't. They were going to put the neck on the line for paying nearly 10 million people in the UK. That's probably better the workforce because of the lockdown. No, nobody knew that. And I think once we saw it happening, then you could see where it's all been totally, unfortunately, logical in terms of the shutdown. And equally, the recovery will be totally logical. Okay, we have one from Manoj here. Um, what's your take on work week? Would people have five day paid employment or would it be three days paid employment, one day freelancing and one day doing stuff you like? Well, um, <laughs> well I think the message is going to be you've got to get back to work five days a week. There'll be you know, more, more. The, the intro again, that, the, 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 talking to those who've got people on furlough. For, like a bench yesterday one of the guys was saying when do you get the call i got the call on friday to return to work are you happy about that no the guy said because they're quite happy being at home they're getting paid they could not you know not, not spending money so a lot of money was returned to on um on credit card debt and borrowing last month from the consumers so i think a lot of people they, they were too happy on, on furlough they're quite happy on furlough but they've got to get back to uh to a five-day week accepting there will be greater flexibility in terms of you know alternative working from home one day or flexible working the hours you work so much more um agile as you know say agile workplace environment 
but yeah, it would be great to get everybody paid five days a week to do nothing. But yeah, uh, not not convinced that's going to happen anytime soon. Okay, and a final one from Steve, just before we wrap up. The world wants Trump out, but I'm worried that the Democrats have chosen the wrong person to guarantee getting him out. <laughs> By the way, I've been the safe choice, but he is accident prone. However, bizarrely, is a Trump second term actually better potentially for the world economy than a Biden win? Wow, that's a good question. First of all, I, you know, I share your concern, Steve, about um, Biden, because as long as he's not speaking, he looks more plausible <laughs> a candidate. Um, but uh, he, he looks a very weak candidate, and there's this danger of, the, in the, of uh, proposing a socialist left-wing agenda which the, you know, in, the, in, in, the, in the house, but I think you know, Trump, my God, Trump is a real danger to the world. And we've seen a significant deterioration in his, in his health and mental well-being that uh, he, you know, the problems he has created and has created um, are so enormous that he, it's a great clip I could have shown you, but you know, saying from the SNL clips, and you're saying, somebody said because of Obamacare, if you change Obamacare, people are gonna die. And the character on SL says, lady, woman, lady, I'm going to be president and we're all going to die. <laughs> There's a real risk that whether it's a war with China, pulling troops out of Germany, pulling troops out of South Korea, getting Japan to pay more for the troops in Japan, uh, war with China, war with... It's just a ludicrous proposition. It's a very, very dangerous proposition. From an economic perspective, you know, Trump's attitude to NATO, Trump's attitude to um, the, the European Union, Trump's attitude to trade deals generally, that's a tremendous price to pay. So I can't believe for one moment that uh, Trump second term would be good for the world economy. Um, and it cannot be. A democratic president couldn't make it any worse. So no, third term. The danger is Trump's thinking about the third term. And actually, the big question is, if he loses the election, how the hell are you going to get him out of the White House? He's putting up a fence. He's checking out his bunker. He's checking out his bunker, so he can lose in November. They're not going to be able to find him. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll see what happens. But. Oh, fantastic. Well, I hope that the questions haven't been too onerous for you, and certainly nowhere near as, as sometimes pressurised as the, the ones following the government's briefing at five o'clock on a daily basis. I do feel a bit sorry for some of those. Uh, John, thank you so much for joining My us. Pleasure. really enjoyed it. It's been extremely interesting. And um, let's hope that, that we, do, we can have a sort of slightly more cheerful pro uh, project to, uh, topic to discuss next time we have you on. Well, I do an extra, I do one on um, lemon drizzle cake. I could do that. Love it. Love <laughs> or, uh, it. Or yoga, and uh, I do that. I can do one on yoga if you like. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining us. And I hope that you found it useful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having me.